So that is God prophesying already that the takeover is happening. This was back in Genesis, the third chapter, verse number 15. That's when the takeover was spoken into the earth. And whenever God speaks, it manifests itself in the earth. So what I want to do, let's go to Galatians 4. Let's go to Galatians, the fourth chapter. This is the way that I learned uh, what was after first, after Acts, you got Acts, and then you have Romans. You got 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. This is the acronym that I learned because I used to get Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and, Col and Colossians mixed, mixed up. Somebody shared with me this acronym, G-E-P-C, go eat pork chops, because I love pork chops. All right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat pork chops, in case you ever forget. Go eat pork chops. Just remember that. That's a free one. All right, so let's go to Galatians. Galatians is after 2 Corinthians. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Go eat pork chops. Galatians, the fourth chapter. Let's look at verse number one. <clears throat> now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Somebody say, but when the fullness of time. But when the fullness of time. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent his son, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Yes. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So Galatians, Paul writes to the church in Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now remember, we saw in in uh, Genesis, the third chapter, that God told the serpent that I'm going to put in between, between you, your seed, and her seed. He's going to bruise your head, and you're going to bruise it. He's going to crush your head, and, and that, that head represents authority. Understand that. Jesus crushed the authority of Satan. So, how does this play out in Scripture? We see this in the New Testament that uh, Paul said when the fullness of time had come. So how many of you guys are ready to flip through Scripture so we can see in the Old Testament how, how God's yes. word is still to manifest the kingdom of God in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Yes. So let's go to Psalm 29. And I'm going to get back to Galatians. Trust me, I will. Psalm 29. I want to show everybody through scripture how this kingdom message is not something I'm making up but this kingdom message is the theme throughout the whole Bible and God is serious about getting his kingdom here on earth Psalm 29 10 Psalm 29 10 it says the Lord sat enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever the Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. Go to Psalms 45, 6. We're going to be flipping kind of fast. I'll tell you when we're going to slow down. Psalms 45, 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, I must teach this accurately. In a kingdom, um, I like watching old movies. Like, I like watching the Robin Hood, the Robin Hood with Kevin Costner and the Robin Hood with, uh, 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 what's the guy's name? Um, he played in Gladiator, I think. Uh, Russell Crowe. You guys seen Russell that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I like watching old king, uh, movies dealing with kingdoms because it helps me to understand the culture of kingdoms back in the day so that I can understand the Bible better. And the scepter is the, the scepter is like a staff. It's like a symbol of authority. Yeah. So when the king has the scepter and he, and, he, and, he, and he's sitting on his throne, 
and he, uh, and, he, and he pushes it forward to people. So that means whatever subject or whatever citizen that's in his presence, when he extends the scepter, that means that that, prep, that person can enter into the presence of the king. Does that make sense? So when it says that the scepter, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom, when the king extends the scepter, that means that you have found favor in the eyes of the king. So when the king, when it says that a scepter of your righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom, that means that in order to please the king, we have to walk in righteousness. We have to be in right standing with the king. So it is not about the outward stuff that we do. It's all about the heart. So whenever our heart is right, whenever we are in right alignment with the king, that means that the king of glory has extended his scepter to us so that we are able to come in his presence Whenever we want. Amen. That's why in, in uh, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We have to be in right standing with the king. Why? Because whenever we are in right standing with the king, he extends his scepter, his favors upon our life. So whatever we need to carry out the task that God has given us to carry out, we have an unlimited access to the resources of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? All right. Let's go to Psalms 103. Looking at verse 17 through 19. Psalms 103. Uh, verses 17 through 19. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to keep at, uh, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Psalms 145, 11 through 13. Psalms 145, 11 through 13. When I read this this week, I began to honor the Almighty God. Because I read the whole chapter. I'm just blessed right here. Verse number one says, I will extol you, O my God, O King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. And all your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you, all your works. So watch this, and this isn't part of the sermon, but watch this. All your works shall praise you, O Lord. So that means that when God said, let there be, God created the heavens and the earth. So the heavens and the earth are praising God right now. Yes. When God said, let there be, and he created the trees, that means the trees and the plants are blessing Almighty God right now. When God said, let there be, and he created the firmaments in the heaven, he created the stars, the galaxies, that means that all of God's works are praising him right now. God created the animals, the bees, the dinosaurs, the, the elephants, the bears. They are praising God right now. Just being natural. They're doing what's natural. The only thing of God's creation that's not doing anything natural is us. But that is changing. That has changed when the king of glory came to earth. Because he brought forth the message of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. They shall speak, verse number 11, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. Generations. Remember, I'm laying the foundation.
showing you guys that God intended for his kingdom to come to earth. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah, the ninth chapter. Isaiah, the ninth chapter, starting at verse number six. Isaiah, the ninth chapter, starting at verse number six. Isaiah is right after the book of Ecclesiastes, which is after Proverbs, which is after Psalms. <laughs> so Psalms, Proverbs, include, uh, yeah, that too. So Isaiah, the ninth chapter, verse number six. I love this. We sing this at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, that child is Jesus Christ. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Somebody say, and the religion shall be on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. Oh, it doesn't say that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it says, and the religion shall be upon his shoulders? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it says, and the government yes. shall be upon his shoulders. Yes. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Hallelujah. Amen. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. Somebody say, forever, ever? Forever. Y'all remember that on Friday, forever? All right. For the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So God spoke through the prophet Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government, that government is the kingdom of God, shall be upon his shoulder. In verse number seven, of the increase, watch this, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 10. I, 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 I want to show up everybody that God intended for his kingdom to manifest. Jeremiah 10, 10. Can you turn that AC up a little bit? It's a little bit chilly. I don't want to sweat, man. Thank you very much. Jeremiah 10, 10. <clears throat> but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and everlasting what? King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Daniel 4.34. Daniel 4.34. For those that may be watching this after it's posted, you may be saying, it's a lot of page turning. Well, we got to know scripture, right? Amen. Scripture interprets scripture. Mm -hmm. And I want everybody to study. Even after I preach, don't take what I say. Study it for yourself. Yes. Yes. So you can get your own revelation. You're going to get revelation while you're here. But God intends for you to have a personal revelation as well. Daniel, the fourth chapter, verse number 34. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, yes. and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Excuse me. He, um, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So we see that, right? Mm -hmm. Let me show you that God's kingdom is established from old and exists from all eternity. Turn to Psalm 74. Psalm 74, verse number 12. Psalm 74, verse number 12. Verse 12. <clears throat> For God is my king. Notice these words, these terminologies. Throne, kingdom, dominion, everlasting to everlasting. You know, scepter, righteousness. Mm -hmm. Notice these, these aren't religious terms. <laughs> They're not religious terms. So, uh, Psalm 74, 12. For God is my king from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. 
For God is my king from of old, working salvation.